everybody. I'm Nicole Pallotta, the Academic Outreach Manager with the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and I just want to extend my own welcome to everyone today. It's really exciting to see so many students here at our second annual student convention. I hope you've enjoyed the lunch, um, and I'm now delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Jessica Rubin. Very excited for her talk. Um, so Professor Rubin is the director of the University of Connecticut School of Law's Legal Practice Program. She um, teaches animal law as well, and she was instrumental in creating Desmond's Law, which allows Connecticut courts to appoint advocates, which are law students under supervision, in animal cruelty cases. Professor Rubin actively supervises students and appears in court to advocate for justice in cases of animal cruelty. She created Yukon Law School's Animal Law Clinic, a clinic through which students appear in state courts as advocates under Desmond's Law. She's widely regarded as an expert in the field of animal law and as a graduate of Cornell University and the Cornell Law School. Professor Rubin has taught in Istanbul, Turkey for the Open Society Foundation and in Seoul, South Korea. In both locations, she supplemented her teaching activities with local stray animal rescue and relocation efforts. So please join me in welcoming Professor, Professor Jessica Rubin. And quickly, we're gonna have a Q&A after her talk, which will be about 30 minutes. So save your questions for the end and then we'll do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, thank you to Lewis and Clark and to the Animal Legal Defense Fund for um, having me here. I am so honored to speak to this group because you are the future of the animal rights movement and the animal law movement. So I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I'm gonna talk to you about something that I think is very concrete and very achievable. And I hope to inspire you and motivate you to pursue similar efforts in your states, and I hope to give you some very practical advice for how to do that successfully. So I'm gonna to talk to you about a new law that we have in Connecticut called Desmond's Law. But before I do that, I wanna pause for a minute, and though it's so hard to compete with such an amazing lunch, I want to just pause here and, and recognize the importance of this new law, because for the first time ever, it gives animals an, a, a, almost a direct voice in the courtroom, and it's a real, in my opinion, significant step in the advancement of animal law and animal rights. So what is Desmond's Law? Desmond's Law is a statute in Connecticut that allows courts to appoint advocates in animal cruelty cases. And I'm gonna ask you to join me for the next 30 minutes to explore the creation of the law and the implementation, and so we can really, think about this novel approach to animal advocacy and hopefully leave you with some advice uh, going forward. So Desmond's Law was created from sort of a perfect storm of, of factors, and I wanna talk about each of these with you. So animal sentience. In the field of sociology and psychology, as everyone in the room would agree, there's been increasing acceptance of the idea that animals have emotions and can feel and experience pain. Second, contributing factor. In the field of criminal justice, there has also been increasing acceptance and acknowledgement of the link between violence to animals and violence to humans. Third, over the last decade, many of the law students in the room don't recognize this, but legal education used to be uh, delivered in a lecture model filled with Socratic st teaching style. Over the last decade, the ABA and, and then law schools have moved towards a model that emphasizes and incorporates experiential legal education, meaning we try to teach law students by giving them, under supervision, chances to practice lawyering. Fourth contributing factor, on a personal level, this legislation would have never happened absent a personal connection with a state legislator. I have a close relationship with a Connecticut state legislator, legis legislator. We've worked together for 10 years, and I knew that if I crafted the right statute, this dedicated, brave, and outspoken legislator with a track record of success would bring this statute before the state legislature and, and see it through. Fifth factor contributing to 
Desmond's Law success, was that in Connecticut, like many states in the United States, we had a problem. What was our problem? Our problem was and continues to be that our anti-cruelty statutes are not vigorously enforced. So look at this. The good news on this slide is that of the cr cruelty cases that go to trial in Connecticut over the last 10 years, right? we have about 3,500 cruelty offenses. Of those that go to trial, 95% of them result in a guilty outcome. Right? That's a wonderful statistic. But what's the problem here? The other statistic is that 80% of our cases don't go to trial. Right? They're either dismissed or not prosecuted. Right? And I want to emphasize here that they're often not prosecuted or dismissed, not because a prosecutor has ill intentions, but because a prosecutor may not have the time the resources or the support to pursue these cases. So the troubling problem in Connecticut historically has been our anti-cruelty statutes were not being vigorously enforced. Okay. So we've got so far a list of precipitating factors and the spark that really made this law come into effect was a tragic case involving a dog named Desmond. So this is Desmond. Desmond was a young, healthy, friendly dog. And Desmond's owner was a woman who had a troubled relationship with her boyfriend. That relationship resulted in a few domestic violence charges in 2011 and 2012. Desmond's owner surrendered Desmond to the local pound. And immediately thereafter, Desmond's owner's boyfriend went to the pound did not disclose to the pound his relationship to the dog, and adopted Desmond. Des uh, the boyfriend then proceeded to beat, strangle, and starve Desmond. He killed Desmond, dumped his body in a trash chute, and when Desmond's body was examined, his stomach was filled with nothing but uh, plastic because he lived his life locked in a bathroom. Why? The dog had been so badly abused by the boyfriend that whenever the boyfriend approached the dog, the dog urinated because he was so upset by the boyfriend. So that's what happened to Desmond. What happened to Desmond's abuser and killer? Rather than face trial and sentencing on animal cruelty charges, Desmond's abuser was allowed to use a probationary or diversionary program through which if he didn't do anything else, Right? If he didn't get in trouble for two more years, his record would be wiped clean. Right? And that's what happened. He didn't do anything else for two years that we know of. And so Desmond's killer now exists out in the world with no record of what happened. He has visitation with children, with his children unsupervised. He could adopt additional animals. Right? There's no record of what he did. So this is one tragic case. We all know that there are many, many, many Desmonds in the world. Right? But this case was the spark that we needed for this statute to succeed. In Connecticut, it was time for a change. Our courts needed help, and our courts needed a push, and we did that through legislation to provide advocates in cases like Desmond's. Right? In Desmond's case, Desmond's killer had a public defender. The state had a prosecutor, but Desmond had nobody. Right? And now under Desmond's law, future victims of animal cruelty can have advocates in cases. So the response to Desmond's case and all that perfect storm of precipitating factors was that public law, Public Act 1630 was enacted. We call it Desmond's Law, and um, it's been codified in our statutes here. So I want to explain to you how this came about from a, a legislative and political process, because as many of you know, uh, it's not easy to pass animal protection legislation in any state, right? And what we needed in our state was collaboration, we needed passion, and we needed legitimacy. And we needed to convey all of that to our legislators. So who played a role in this? We had several collaborators, right? Animal protection groups, the Humane Society, the ASPCA, came to the table together. The University of Connecticut, where I teach, stood behind this statute and said to the legislature, 
If you pass this, we will provide a steady stream of law students to staff this new position. The State Department of Agriculture stood behind our proposed statute and said, we'll help, right? We will host online the list of advocates. So the fact that we had the state's university, we had the state's Department of Agriculture really signaled to the legislature that there was cross-agency cooperation here, and they loved that. We had supporters from grassroots individuals and animal protection organizations to uh, advocates in the domestic violence field, individuals who came out to support and testify in favor of the proposed law. Who opposed Desmond's law? Who do you think opposed Desmond's law? Okay. Surprisingly, the Connecticut Dog Federation opposed Desmond's law. The Connecticut Veterinary Medical Association opposed Desmond's law. Desmond's law. Why? Two reasons. They feared that it would create legal mischief by, by providing standing to animals. And second, they feared that it would restrict owners' rights to do as they pleased with their animals, which the cruelty statutes already restrict. Okay. But those were, those were their complaints. So we had sort of the, the expected supporters, some surprising opponents, and therefore we needed to go into the political or legislative process ready to make some compromises. What sort of compromises did we make along the way? The first version of Desmond's Law allowed courts to appoint advocates in any case of cruelty, right? cruelty against any animal. And so we had a lot of pushback from legislators from more rural parts of our state saying, we don't want this to apply in cases of cruelty to livestock. And I hated making this concession. I hated cutting the statute back to apply to only cat and dog cruelty cases. But the advice that I was given by my wise legislator colleague was to allow the statute to be enacted in a more restricted, limited form, and then in the future to work towards an, an amendment that would broaden its coverage. So the first compromise we made was to limit the animals um, to whom the law would apply. The second compromise that came up the law, again, in its original form, said that the advocate represents the interests of the animal. And some legislators said, that sounds like standing, and that freaks us out. That scares us. Right? So we struggled with the right language, and we settled on the phrase that the advocate represents the interests of justice. And I hated that compromise, too. But I will tell you that that phrase, the interests of justice, in practice, has been a far more generous and wide charge than representing just the interests of the animal. Why? Because in most of my cases, the animal is dead. Right? They no longer have interests. But allowing the advocate to, advo to pursue the interests of justice allows us to speak to things like community safety, other affected animals. And so that compromise ended up being a very, very wise and successful one. The third compromise we had to make. The first draft of the statute said that the court must appoint an advocate in every case. We had to settle on permissive appointment. The fourth compromise that came up, we wanted to require some kind of qualification and training to, in order to be an advocate. And there was a lot of resistance from the Bar Association so that we ended up saying that anybody with an interest in animal law can serve as an advocate. The final compromise that we had to make, or that we chose to make, was to allow the list of advocates to be managed by the state's Department of Agriculture. Okay. And this, again, was a very important signal to the legislature that we had multiple state agencies cooperating on this venture. What does the State Department of Agriculture do? They, they host a web page where judges and prosecutors can go to see who is an advocate. That's all they do. They don't exercise any control over who gets on the list or who gets appointed. So it was a, a very worthwhile uh, concession to make. So those are, that gives you an example of some of the compromises that we made along the, the way. So the Desmond's Law was enacted in May of 2016. And how have we implemented it? 
What have I done? What have we done? The first thing that I did before the law went into effect in October of 2016 was I engaged in my own little public relations campaign. campaign. I contacted every prosecutor in our state and every judge. And I said, here's this new law, here's what it does, please consider appointing advocates. I gave them a copy of the, the law, gave them the legislative history. So I did a lot of outreach. I also did a lot of internal building, programmatic building. And because I didn't know what kind of supply of cases we would have, right? how many courts would say, yes, we're gonna use this law, initially, I just asked a couple of students to volunteer. I said, I don't know what, what the supply is gonna be, but would you do this? And all of a sudden, we had a lot of cases. First we had two, then we had six, then we had 10. So we moved from a volunteer model to an independent study model, to a full-blown course, to a full-blown clinic. And thank thankfully, um, I had wonderful support from the law school along the way. So now we have a full-blown Yukon Animal Law Clinic that is dedicated to staffing Desmond's Law cases. Right. The third thing I did to implement Desmond's Law was to be sure that when we were involved in a case, we conducted a broad range of activities. I didn't want to have just one specific role in these cases. So we are flexible. When we get into a case, we serve the court. We do what the court does. If the court wants a report on the link, we'll do that. If the court wants an argument on the use of a probationary program, we do that. So we are flexible. We also have involved lawyers across a state, the state because Desmond's Law allows either law students or volunteer lawyers to serve as advocates. So it's important to me that we encompass and involve our lawyers in our state because we can't handle every case. So we have a group of about 20 lawyers who are now signed up to be, act as advocates, and we do a lot of training of those lawyers so that we can share information, share results, and share strategies. The other important aspect of the implementation of Desmond's Law is Desmond's Army. What is Desmond's Army? Desmond's Army is a grassroots, grassroots group of animal activists who track every cruelty case in Connecticut. And they show up at these cruelty cases and sit silently to let the court know that there is public concern and public support for these cases. So Desmond's Army plays a critical role in implementing Desmond's Law. Why? Because they call me every time there's a new cruelty case. They call me and they say, we have a new case. And then we talk about which advocate is near there geographically, which advocate's personality fits that court, and we together allocate cases to all the advocates, students as well as volunteer lawyers. The last thing that's really important is that Desmond's Law only works if courts use it, right? It only works, it's, it's optional for courts, so it only works if advocates are appointed. So when I started out by saying I, I sent these letters, and I got, a, we were appointed in quite a few cases at the beginning. Those initial appointments came at our request. I would find out about a new cruelty case and I would write to the court and say, please consider appointing us. And then I would get in the mail an appointment. Sometimes it came as a certificate with a gold seal on it. Right? But now an interesting thing is happening. Now the courts and prosecutors on their own are requesting our appointments. So we don't, no longer need to reach out and, and ask. The courts are coming to embrace the, the program. So. As I mentioned, the law went into effect in October of 2016, and I had no idea what to expect. I didn't know if it was gonna be one case or five cases at best. So let's look at how we're doing, right? So what I've done on the, the y-axis is the number of cases. The x-axis are the six-month intervals that Desmond's Law has been in effect since October of 2016. And you can see, so the blue portion of the bar graph are, represents Yukon cases, and the red portion represents cases in which volunteer lawyers are acting as advocates. And you can see this upward trend. The first six months, you know, we had two cases. The second six months, we got an additional six cases. 
And then look where we are now. We have 12 cases and then 12 cases. So we have a total of 36 cases in the first two years of Desmond's Law use. And so I was pleased with that. I'm proud of that. And I hope that the trend continues upward in our state and that the trend continues outward to your states. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what our students actually do, what an advocate does in a case. So as mentioned, the first step for any advocate is to, become, to get appointed in a case. But then the advocate has a lot of work to do. The advocate usually starts by reviewing the police report and the warrant in a case. The advocate may then consult with the prosecutor to give an opinion as to whether the charges are appropriate. The advocate then spends time interviewing the animal control officer and any veterinarian that might have been involved in a case. The advocate then has an opportunity to make factual presentations and recommendations to the court as to the proper disposition of the case. The advocate also has an opportunity to conduct oral argument in court at the time a defendant applies for a diversionary or probationary program. The advocate can say, we don't think that this defendant should be entitled to use this probationary program because the crime that they are charged with is serious or is likely to reoccur. Right? So we present arguments in court with respect to a defendant's application to a diversionary program. Our advocates also participate in plea bargain negotiations and make recommendations as to the proper sentencing of a defendant. Our advocates have played a very, very valuable role, bringing a lot of value to the table in cases where there are interim issues of ownership and possession. Right? Often, you know, our prosecutors will, may do a very good job at the end of the case in terms of sentencing, but at the start of a case, the issues of who continues to own an animal, who continues to own other animals, are very important, and often a prosecutor does not have the time or the resources to address those interim issues. So that's a place where an advocate can really help animals by resolving those issues early on in the case. And finally, when our cases do go to trial, our advocates can present um, victim impact statements. So there's a lot that advocates can do to assist our prosecutors, to assist our courts, and to push them or prompt them. We serve as an extra resource to the court. Our prosecutors may have the best intentions, but when I see them walk into court with a stack of files this high, I say, let us help you. Right? We can help, and we do. All right? So I want to talk to you about a few cases where we were able to bring value to the cases and help. So this is the first case that, um, one of our early cases, in which the defendant was charged with eight counts of criminal neglect, of eight pit bulls. And at the start of the case, when the police went into the house, they immediately seized the eight pit bulls. And so that puts possession of the animals with the town police. It doesn't resolve the ownership or the title to the animals. So those animals are stuck in a pound for the duration of the lawsuit, which in Connecticut could be anywhere from one to two years. Right? If the animals were not ruined going in to the pound, they're cer certainly going to be ruined after one to two years in a cage. Right? So our first effort when we got into this case, when we were appointed, was to get those animals out of the pound so they can go on with their lives, to be rehomed. And the defendant in this case contested our ability to do that. We were able to present a legal argument regarding ownership to the court. The court determined that the animals had been abandoned to the town. And the wonderfully satisfying thing was that that decision was given at 11 o'clock. By 12, I had the animal control officer with me in court. As we walked out of court, having received that great decision, he picked up the phone, and those animals were out of the kennel, out of the pound within an hour. And one of them was about to give birth, and she was able to deliver her puppies in her foster home rather than in the pound. So that is a, an example of how an advocate can make things happen faster in a case than a prosecutor may be, be able to do. Animals shouldn't sit in a pound for a year or two, right? and we were able to, to facilitate that process. Another example of something an advocate can do, same case, a year, six months later. So the defendant, you know, we resolved ownership of the animals, but the defendant's case continued. And the defendant applied for a diversionary program. So rather than going to trial 
and being sentenced for animal cruelty. He applied to use a diversionary program that is available for people with psychological disabilities. Right? It's available if you have a psychological impairment and if your crime is not serious. In support of his application for this diversionary program, the defendant presented letters, thank you letters, from animal rescue organizations saying thank you for volunteering for us, thank you for your donations. And because I have four students working with me, right, my students looked at those letters, they hopped onto Google, and they said, those letters are forged. Right? And so we were able to present evidence of that forgery to the court to convince the court that this defendant did not have a psychological impairment. In, indeed, he was able to concoct a plan. He had the intent and the care to construct these forged letters. So based on, on that, plus additional evidence of the seriousness of the crime, we were able to oppose, successfully oppose the defendant's use of that diversionary program. So that's a second example from the same case. The third example I wanna to talk to you about is a case involving a backyard breeder. And this case is interesting because the case suffered from miscommunication. We had state police raiding the property and collecting evidence, and we had local town police collecting evidence on the property. And each jurisdiction was accumulating evidence and accumulating uh, multiple charges against this defendant. And, and that was fine because that, that allowed the cruelty case to, to go forward. But the problem was, this is January in Connecticut. It was cold. And we wanted those dogs out of these dangerous conditions. And so we were able to synthesize and collect all of that information from the animal control officers, from the police, from the state level and the town. They were speaking past one another. We were able to, as, as advocates, interface between these two um, entities and say, here's what happened, and we prepared a lovely file that was, a, that was compelling enough to convince the state's attorney general to initiate proceedings to get the possession of the dogs immediately. Right? In Connecticut, we have a process called civil forfeiture that allows us, aside from the criminal action, to grab uh, property. So that's another example of where the advocates, in, in acting quickly and with flexibility, can bring some value to these cases. So what kind of impact has Desmond's Law had? So I've given you three examples of some very real, tangible results delivered to animal victims in cases. In addition to that, I am hoping that with enough cases behind us, we can accumulate some statistics that say, in addition to improved outcomes for animal victims, we're seeing improved outcomes in sentencing so that our cruelty cases, our cruelty statutes are, more be, are being more vigorously enforced. So that's one piece of area of impact I'm hoping to see. The second is we are delivering training to our state's animal control officers, our state's prosecutors, and our state's legal advocates as to how to better handle these cases. And third, we are formulating a program within our state to help courts diagnose and treat individuals who are charged with animal cruelty, to separate out the real dangerous, concerning defendants from those who um, just need some education. So here's an example of one of our recent training programs that was supported by ALDF. And you, know, you can see an animal control officer working with a prosecutor, working with, very importantly, a member of Desmond's Army. We never forget that our, our grassroots are supportive and integra integral to the work that we do. So I hope that this makes you want to do something like this, right, in your schools, in your states. Right? Having a university behind you makes it all the more doable. So if this is something that you want to consider, I want to talk to you about a few issues that you should be aware of as you go into the drafting process. Try to make appointment of an advocate mandatory in every case. Try to have Desmond's Law cover all animals, not just dogs and cats. Try to include a provision that makes probation or a diversionary program unavailable in at least felony animal cruelty cases. Try to incorporate some requirements for the qualification of advocates, right? They need to be educated, they need to go through a course, a training course. Try to think about how cases will be allocated across your state. Try to think about the advocate's role. 
What information can they access in a case? What can they do? Can they attend hearings? Can they attend plea bargain negotiations? Spell it out. And think about whether you need to provide immunity so that advocates can't be sued by angry or upset defendants. So as I look towards the future, I, I will share with you my, my fantasy. My fantasy is that Desmond's Law spreads to every state. I hope that we can accumulate statistical evidence that will be persuasive to other states as well as our state to show that Desmond's Law has been impactful. I hope that we and other states can continue to train our ACOs, our prosecutors, our lawyers, and our judges about how to better handle cruelty cases. I hope that we can progress in the way that we diagnose cruelty offenders and treat them, and that at least in our state, we continue to legislate on this very important issue, including selecting out certain cruelty cases from eligibility for probation or diversionary programs, that we specifically contemplate that there are times when animal cruelty can qualify as domestic violence, that we can get our ownership of animals through expedited means of civil forfeiture so they don't languish in pounds while, they, while we wait for criminal cases to unfold, and that we continue to improve Desmond's Law. Right? Every time we face a challenge, I think we need to go back and, and fix the statute. So there's a lot of work ahead of us in Connecticut, and I hope this motivates you to start down this path in your respective states. So I'm happy to um, end there and answer any questions that you all might have. Um, hi. I was just wondering if there's any way um, that you think you'd be able to maybe quantify um, the impact that this has had on domestic violence. Like, I know you're trying to look kind of for statistics that um, the impact on prosecution for the animal cruelty uh, laws that you have, but I didn't know, because a lot of times, a lot of the legislatures are motivated by the impact that it has on humans, so I didn't know if there's any way you can kind of, if, if you think that So what I can quantify at this point does not relate to domestic violence. I can quantify that fewer cases are being dismissed or nollied right now than before Desmond's Law, right? That's as far as I can go. I can't speak to um, any kind of deterrent effect on domestic violence cases, but I can say that many of these cases have, have charges of both domestic violence and animal cruelty. So um, I can't draw any inferences yet from that, and I, I just, you know, we're too soon into the process to be able to make a, a claim as to an effect. Thank you. You said that um, in giving the concession up of not, not including all animals, that you thought maybe down the road an amendment. What kind of timeline do you see in that becoming a reality? Oh, I think that depends on the politics, right? I'm going to wait until um, the composition of the legislature is such that, that I feel like it would be successful. But I, I was also told that it takes three times for a piece of legislation to, to pass. So um, you know, I, I, I think I want to wait and see how the, the upcoming elections play out and the composition of the legislature and, and time, it, time it right. You got to wait for some of the legislators in the rural parts of the state to resign. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. So one of the points that you touched on was the fact that this also deals with concerns around uh, exper experimental legal education. So I just wanted to know, in your experience uh, and based on the opinion of your faculty members, do you think it's been successful uh, in terms of giving that practical experience to students? And yeah, do you foresee maybe other professors doing something similar in their areas of law that might not be animal law related? Yes, so it's been tremendously successful in two ways. The students get quick experience and they get good quality experience. They get quick experience. For example, my, this summer I had a case the day, at, so in Connecticut our students can't appear in court as interns until they finish their first year. I had a student in court the day after his last final exam, spring semester, right? So the, the, within hours of finishing his first year, 
uh, he was in court. So they get fast experience, and they also get high quality experience because they are making substantive legal arguments, right? They're conducting factual investigations and interviews of experts, ACOs and vets. Um, so they're doing legal research, they're doing factual research, research and they're doing oral argument. So um, they, to me, they're acting as lawyers. And once we get to court, I keep my mouth closed. I let them do all the talking. I write, write notes furiously next to them, but they are doing all the talking. And so I think they are getting high quality legal experience. I hope it transfers to other areas of the law, right? So maybe an environmental law clinic would adopt this model, right? I hope so. Obviously, I'm not a student, but I do have a question. So um, do they actually put the case one, or they're just making oral arguments about the diversion or those kind of issues? They're making oral arguments on all pretrial issues that come up. When we get to trial, the prosecutor is handling it, and we do the victim impact statement. But in addition to the diversionary program hearing, there are a lot of other pretrial hearings that come up. Who's going to own the dog? Can we t remove the other dogs from the household? Um, and so on each of those occasions, they're making a substantive legal argument. So I have two more questions, and I'll let one of the students ask. So um, you said the, f the first case, um, you said something, and then you said something later that made me think that's the answer. But who handles the forfeiture of the animals, the civil forfeiture? You said the attorney general's office? It depends. Okay. Okay. If the case has been investigated and charged by the town police law enforcement, okay. like the town ACO, then the town's civil lawyer, court, like the counsel for the like town. the county attorney or the town attorney. Right. Okay. If the state ACOs investigated the case, then it's our state civil lawyer, our attorney general's office that handles it. And so in that case, we had both going at the same time. Because the civil forfeiture statute in Connecticut is so rarely used, nobody knows, uh, the town attorneys don't know how to, how to do it. So the problem in that case was the town attorneys had collected, or the town ACOs had collected a lot of evidence, but their lawyer didn't know how and didn't want to initiate the civil forfeiture. So we had to transfer all that information from town ACO to the state AG because and they're so the ones who could bring the forfeiture action. Your advocates help that happen. We, we were the intermediaries because the information that the town ACO had compiled was like a, a stack of photos and, and descriptions that the AG's office didn't want to wade through. So we took that and we streamlined it into a timeline and a report, gave it to the AG, had a phone call with the AG, and they said, okay, we'll take the case. But that would have never happened if they had to go through that. And do you have a bond provision in your civil statute? We do. Okay. We okay. do. And you, how did you talk University of Connecticut, um, is that right, UConn? Yes. Into letting you do this? Because I think it's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't know, I, how did I do I traded in, I traded in 20 years of goodwill, and I went to my dean. <laughs> I said, you know, you, you know me, you know, I'm not gonna do something crazy here. Um, and, and truthfully, you know, I've been practicing and teaching in Connecticut for 20 years, and so when I say I engaged in public relations and I reached out to the judicial branch, I know a lot of them. I know a lot of the prosecutors. So that's helped. And I think just having a, a reputation and goodwill, and this is really good advice for students, you know, the moment you step, step foot into your, the beginning of your career, everything you do will start accumulating as your reputation, good or bad. And so this was, for me, you know, my one, my one ask. And I sort of traded in all my chips and said, would you support this? And it's interesting because our law school has an ag school. We have a huge medical research facility. And so there were some internal concerns, like is this gonna be seen as internally inconsistent with the university's provisions? But you know, I, we were simply encouraging enforcement of an existing anti-cruelty law, so. Hey, right here. Um, I, you've talked a lot about your presence in criminal courts. I'm just wondering if you are present or if you ever see yourself being present in other courts, like family courts, small claims for animals. 
No, because you know, the clinic and the activities of my students are specifically authorized under Desmond's Law, which relates only to criminal cruelty cases or forfeiture cases. The only exception might be um, a, a marriage separation where there's an issue of the interests of the animal. So, but uh, you know, we're not gonna involve ourselves in a, a tort claim for damages for an animal. We have time for one more question. So going off of what you just said, um, do, you, do you see your advocates ever going in on a, uh, an animal custody case where the interests of the animal need to be represented? Or do you see like a future in that in your state? Perhaps, I, you know, I, um, I don't think that's where, um, I'm, I'm not sure that we would bring more value to the court, you know, the court's job is to, to do justice, and so um, I, I don't contemplate that. But you know, if the, if the statute was amended to put us into those kind of cases, sure, sure. That was a short question. I don't know if you want one. Yeah, we have time for actually one more. I fibbed. <laughs> Uh, you talked a little bit about the compromises you made uh, for a variety of things. You didn't really talk about um, the permissive versus mandatory compromise you made, and then like a subcategory of that. Um, you know, have there been cases that you just didn't have enough students or volunteers to take the cases? You know, if you're talking about other states to implement mandatory, um, you know, appointments, uh, is there a capacity problem? Um, right now, there is no capacity problem. Uh, if we expanded Desmond's Law to cover all animals and made it mandatory, we would have had, instead of 36 cases over the last two years, we would have had 84 cases. I think we still could have covered that. Uh, why did we make it permissive? We were given the advice that if we uh, made it mandatory, it, it wouldn't have passed. Why did we not require training of advocates? That would incur a cost. And in Connecticut, like I'm sure every other state, you know, legislation that comes with a cost is doomed. So um, those, those are the reasons why we, we made those compromises. Hi. Hi, could you speak a little bit about the legislative process? So after you made the concessions that you talked about, what was the, the battle like? Was it intense, or did you have a lot of support, and were there sources of unexpected support or sources of unexpected opposition? Um, so I, I, the way things happen in Connecticut, um, typical New England, everybody is very polite, but then they go behind closed doors, and it hashes out, out there. So was it intense? I, I think for those of us who were vested in the issue. It felt very intense. For other legislators who had tax as their priority, this was just that animal bill. So um, I felt like it was intense. Um, well, I'm sorry, what was your? So I was asking if there are unexpected sources of support or unexpected sources of opposition. I was shocked that the Connecticut Veterinary Medical Association opposed it. But others said, oh yeah, you know, they oppose everything. Um, were we I was surprised, coming back to your question, I was surprised at the level of support that my university provided. Um, I was also surprised at the level of support that we got from prosecutors in the state. And so, yeah, there were some surprises and there were also some you know, expected players in the game. I was not surprised that we got resistance from the rural parts of the state because um, yeah. they want to protect what they, they do. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was incredible. I learned a lot. And did you have? So I just want to. Yes. So in, in closing, I hope that this, this is um, motivating for some of you, and um, to feel 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 free to contact me if I can be of any help to you in your efforts in your state to build a program like this. Um, and I hope it it flourishes. So thank you for your attention, and I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you.